know I stress more than you. I'm broke. What? What? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Think Outside the Blue Box podcast. I'm Anthony Rivera, the lead videographer and editor here at Blue Box Digital. And today I'm being joined by the cast and crew of the short film that you kind of just watched the clip of. Uh, it's called The Heist. It's a buddy comedy. Uh, it's a short film that was uh, created for a special project. And I'm going to let the director here come on and, and kind of tell you. She's been on the podcast before. Welcome to the show, Miss Cora. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's awesome to be back. I'm Cora. I'm a light-skinned woman with dark hair. I've got short bangs and um, a little sparkly Jewish star necklace, denim jacket, and a purple tank top uh, sitting in front of a blurred out wall. Um, yeah, so uh, that's me. Hello. Hi, um, Cora. <laughs> should I let everybody else introduce themselves or should I start talking? Yes. Yeah, everybody can just introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I am a uh, very pale uh, 20s young adult woman um, with uh, basically no hair. Uh, I identify as bald, but I haven't shaved for like a few days. So there's a little, little tiny, tiny bit of hair. Um, I'm sitting in front of a uh, white uh, wall of cabinet doors. I am wearing a purple tank top with a sparkly collar and matching sparkly earrings. Hi everyone, I'm Stevie. I'm a light-skinned 40-year-old woman. I've got a long brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm sitting in front of a blurred background of a bedroom with a purple shirt and a cream sweater. All right, welcome ladies, welcome to the show. And just for people that are actually watching it, let, let's kind of explain why, why is everybody uh, 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 verbally describing themselves? Um, I can answer that one. So part of who we are as a company, as far as Space Dream Productions goes, um, we focus a lot on inclusion and accessibility because there are people out there who are visually impaired or have limited visibility. Tongue twister for me to say. Yeah. Providing audio descriptions of who we are kind of gives people a little bit of context so they can hear our voice and kind of have an idea of what we look like. And that way it kind of balances for those who are able to see us visually and can kind of see who's talking on the screen. Oh yeah, that's awesome. And that, that kind of goes into the the project that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it was part of a, uh, a challenge. Uh, if you would, Cora, kind of tell us a little bit about what the challenge is. It was a short film project that you guys worked on for a specific challenge. Uh, why, why don't you tell us about the organization and, and why they kind of do this and why you guys decided to, to participate? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the project was made for the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. And the idea is, you may have heard of projects like the 48 Hour Film Challenge, where you have 48 hours to completely make a film. Um, that isn't necessarily accessible. I know I've done several of them. It usually causes uh, negative ramifications on my body. Um, and the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge was a response to that to provide a more accessible version of um, having a film challenge, you have about five days. It launched on April 2nd and the film had to be completed on April 7th. So we were given a genre of buddy comedy. We were allowed to write a draft of the film and kind of develop the concept, but we weren't given the themes that were required to be included, the props that were required to be included, the locations that were required to be included. So we had to include all of these things and finalize and lock our script after it got launched on April 2nd. And then we had about five days to completely produce, edit, score, audio design, mix, VFX, color grade, export and upload the film. The idea is that you're required to have at least one person with a disability in a major role. So whether it's on screen as a lead talent or behind the camera as a director, producer, writer, editor, et cetera. Because of our network and because of who we are, I know we had at least two uh, able-bodied people <laughs> on set, but every single person for any sort of key production role, directing, producing, writing, uh, lead talent, editing, color, sound design, score, 
um, post-production supervisor, pre-production, um, all of that stuff. It was all people with disabilities and, um, even people who didn't have disabilities, like they had a stunt, uh, actress, her brother is a wheelchair user. We had someone who's a cancer survivor. So like, it was all people where the disability community is still something they're a part of, even if it's not directly for them. I guess that kind of leads us into Stevie. I know if you watched the clip at the beginning of this, you saw there was a lot of sign language. So let, let's go ahead and get into that. How did Stevie get involved in the in the project? Well, she's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and soon as it said buddy comedy, I was like, I literally messaged her and I was like, um, do you just like low key want to come to Florida and be in a movie? And she was like, uh, I'll let her answer the rest of that. Okay. <laughs> I 100% was, yeah, yeah, I do. It depends on when it is. And it turns out it just happened to be in the the, the best time to where it was easier for me to go because I was really already decided I was going to go no matter what, even if it wasn't convenient. But um, it turns out it, it made it a little bit easier. But no, I the second she said it, and especially who she said it was for, I, I was all in. It was a no brainer. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so when you, when you were brought into the project, how, how did you feel about, you know, the, the, the cause, the, the, the reason why they're doing this challenge? Well, part of my life is about advocacy for those of us with disabilities. I specifically work with deaf and hard of hearing and, and advocacy rights for, for them. But at the same time, a lot of the things that we do is really good for everyone those with disabilities, even people without disabilities. So I 100% wanted to join because the Easter Seals is known for, for really a lot of that, not just the film project, but just the, the organization themselves. They're known for a lot of advocacy, for really just a lot of education about different types of people and different cultures, and I really wanted to be a part of that. Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of talked to you guys beforehand, but uh, you guys don't know. Uh, I was actually approached by a good friend of mine, Kira Taylor. Shout out to Kira. She actually uh, has cystic fibrosis, and she, you know, she wanted to create a short film with with us and the crew. We just couldn't get it. You know, it just didn't line up. Kind of like what you guys did last year. It just didn't line up, uh, so we couldn't do it. But next year, Kira, I, I got you. We're we're gonna be right up there with you guys. So. Um, uh, let, let's kind of discuss you. You are hard of hearing, correct? Yes, I do. I identify as culturally deaf, but I am physically hard of hearing. And uh, the difference between that is basically um, if you think about it from a medical perspective, I'm hard of hearing because I grew up hearing and I do have some residual hearing. So in in a perfect environment, which is not really any environment, but almost in a perfect environment, I could hear probably 75, 80 percent of what's going on. My brain's going to fill in the rest because I know what the language sounds like, feels like, um, even the movements and everything. I know what, what it's like because I grew up hearing and lost my hearing and started about 19 years old. Um, but I'm culturally deaf because I use sign language in my daily life. I prefer that as my mode of communication whenever possible. And I, I am part of the deaf culture. So a little bit hard to understand if you're not in it, but, um, I do identify as deaf, even though I do have some residual hearing because everyone's experiences and upbringing and culture is all different for our community. Yeah, no. And, and for those, for those of you that are watching her, she's kind of reading the, the captions provided by zoom. So she actually has to read before she can respond. So that's why there's a little bit of a delay, but I, again, I appreciate you guys coming on and, and talking and, and, you know, kind of bringing attention to, uh, not, not only this, this, uh, film festival and challenge, but also, you know, the community as a whole. Uh, I have personally been interested in learning sign language, ASL. So if you guys can help me out, kind of show me a couple things, you know, <laughs> that'd be awesome. We could teach you how to sign a fence. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that was one of our big ones we had to think about because I had to think how you would sign it because there isn't a direct sign for it. And we wanted something that would be quick enough to throw in since we only have five minutes. Um, a lot of the times we just describe what something is because um, it's not a translation between the two languages, it's an interpretation. And so we kind of had to create something just for it, but it worked out great. No, oh, that's awesome. And, and speaking of fence, let's go ahead and bring in Sarah. Uh, she is apparently the fence in, in the film. So uh, uh, Sarah, how did you get involved in the project? I think I was the one who brought it to Cora's attention, honestly. Um, so my friend last year reached out. She knows I'm in film and she's a huge disability advocate like I am. And she said, hey, this challenge exists. Like, 
this would be so cool if you participated. And last year, the timing just didn't line up with all the other projects we had going on because we're busy people. We got a lot of things going on. But this year, I made it a priority and I brought it to Cora and I said, hey, let's do this. Like, this is right up our alleys of being both filmmakers and disability advocates. Let's make a project uh, together and be involved. I have my service dog, Daisy, who has been my buddy since uh, like 2016, 2017 ish. So we've been together for, for several years now. And I knew that. I also wanted to bring her as part of the film, so I pitched the idea of if if it makes sense, obviously, and the storyline can align it. I would love if Daisy was involved as well. Um, oh, so she so she that, is the dog in the movie then? Yes. Oh, that that's is so my Daisy. Cool. That's awesome. Yep, um, and it was really fun for me to do that because I've never done anything where acting, especially that Daisy was involved, because. Really, the only times I've ever seen service dogs depicted in film or anything was when the storyline was someone about the service dog. So one of the things for me that was a priority was just having a service dog because I have a service dog, not because it's about having a service dog. And so that was a really fun uh, thing that we got to play with and bring into the film. And so uh, joining together with Stevie and Cora to bring this to life uh, with Daisy was really fun. And Daisy's a sweetie so she just makes it even better on set <laughs> oh no that's awesome did, did you guys Daisy. did you guys already know sign language before hopping on this project i know you guys did really well in the movie so i'm assuming you already knew kind of we all i mean obviously stevie's fluent in sign language um sarah and i both uh knew some sign language but we definitely aren't as fluent as stevie which is also why we used something called SimCom, which is simultaneous communication. So um, Stevie can explain more of what that is. But before she does, I just wanted to add a note about the casting, um, just because Sarah mentioned that like you usually don't see a service dog unless the film is about a service dog. That was something that was really important to me in how this film got made. Sarah amazingly uh, was like, you know, it's, it's coming up, like, don't forget, <laughs> um, made sure that we got registered. And I, um, I really like organic representation. Like the, I feel like the conversations that we have in the film about disability are just where it would have organically come up in a conversation anyway, not because there's cameras pointed at us and because, oh, now is the time where I talk about how I'm, you know, this is my PSA moment. Like, and PSAs have their place. Those types of films can be very educational and informative, but I wanted it to be about the heist. I wanted it to be about the people, about the problems, about the struggles, about the, the humor and the friendship. And I think it was Sarah's idea to have Daisy grab the card or we were together and I saw Daisy grab something like just having that as the moment was like such a linchpin for the story. And then usually there's an issue with representation and casting in that people who don't have disabilities get cast in roles of people who do have disabilities. And for our film, we actually flipped the table a little bit because uh, Star, Stevie's character, she's deaf, but she's otherwise completely able-bodied. Um, Stevie, on the other hand, is not. <laughs> so we needed a stunt double so that Star could do this like intricate gymnastics routine down the hallway. So we ended up with a person with a disabilities portraying an able-bodied character um, where, you know, the fact that Star is deaf is just part of her life. It's not a movie about where like that defines her and that's everything there is about her. And like, yes, my character is very overwhelmed with medical bills, but I mean, that could be anybody like, you know, you get in a car accident, you could be overwhelmed with medical bills. Um, so we very authentically cast the characters. Um, I am a mixed mobility uh, person. I do occasionally need to use a wheelchair. Sarah genuinely has a service dog. Her service dog was cast in the film right alongside her. So um, we tried to keep it as authentic and organic um, as we could. Um, and I'll let CV explain what SimCom is now that everybody's been waiting for that. Yeah. So, um, 
I mean, and I'll, I want to talk about that authenticity too, but it's, yes, so SimCom is short for simultaneous communication. So basically it means that you are signing and speaking at the same time. Um, the difference between that and just typical American Sign Language is that American Sign Language has its own grammar and structure, and it is not the same as English. It's actually closer to Spanish and French than it is to English. So if you are simcoming or if you're signing and speaking at the same time, you're not following American Sign Language's grammar or structure. So it's it's we call it pigeon signed English um, in the community where you basically sign ASL signs, but in English word order. And we often do that when we are around um, hearing people who don't sign. If we're not doing something that's a, a more private conversation. Um, and so that's why my character kind of code switches back and forth. She says some things where she really just is just for her best friend. And so those lines are only in ASL others are just they're meant for everybody so she signs and speaks at the same time when it's just her and her friend alone she doesn't voice because she doesn't need to there's no need to um, when Sarah's around even though Sarah knows a little bit of sign language being the fence she's not necessarily fluent so she brings my character brings that English in to bring accessibility so it's like it's like accessibility begets accessibility so it's kind of awesome Awesome. And, and you were going to mention something about inclusivity and, and accessibility. Oh, yeah. Just about about the character changing um, and code switching throughout the film on purpose. And then we brought uh, or Cora actually brought an extra line towards the beginning where we wanted to kind of explain also why that might be for people who wouldn't already understand it. Um, so we added a line about how Star's mother didn't learn to sign. And so she had to learn how to speak and how to to read lips and do her best in, in the world, which is very, very common for uh, the deaf community. Over 95% of deaf people are born to hearing parents. And of those hearing parents, the majority of them do not learn sign language. So most are forced into this kind of oralism mindset and we're we live in a hearing world, so we have to be able to learn how to survive. And so that's that's something we wanted to bring in there that that is very real for us. And not, it wasn't a dig at my own mother since my mom is actually learning sign language. But um, we wanted to kind of bring that in to help explain why I would be code switching throughout the film. Oh, that is so cool. Now that I understand that, you know, it has, has a different meaning to it now that if I rewatch the movie. That's awesome. Let, let's talk a little bit about some of the terminology too. I know we kind of touched up a little bit on on spoons, uh, Sarah. If you, you you did a great job of explaining that to me, if you wouldn't mind, uh, kind of rehashing that. What what is spoons? Absolutely. So for those who are uh, unfamiliar, spoons comes from spoon theory, which is something that the disability and chronic illness communities have utilized to explain when you only have limited energy throughout the day. What spoons am I supposed to use to do this? I've already had to use my wheelchair more in the last six months than in the last six years. What happens if I need to use it that day? So the idea is you start the day and you have a set amount of spoons and each task that you do throughout the day takes a certain amount of spoons. So say taking a shower takes five spoons or walking the dog takes three spoons. I'm just totally making up amounts. But it, whenever you run out of spoons is when you run out of energy and therefore you can do no more tasks. So it's a really great visual representation to help people understand that when you are disabled or you have a chronic illness and you are operating off limited energy, it's not a mindset it is a literal this is how much energy i have and that is the amount of energy for the day and i can't make more energy i can't come up with it out of thin air this is it so it helps people visualize what the limitations are and how that limitations can be applied to real life no oh, that's awesome and you guys were also mentioning that there's a little bit of uh easter egg in the film kind of a, a nod a little nudge nudge to the, the spoons comment if you guys want to want to go into that yeah, I'll answer that one. Um, so Stevie had the great idea of us having like friendship necklaces that have little spoons on them. She said that Star would wear that sort of out of solidarity with Lily, my character. So um, uh, throughout the whole film, we're wearing these little silver spoon necklaces. And then there is, uh, there's so many Easter eggs in this in this film. Oh, I noticed. But, um, I was, I was going to talk to you about that. <laughs> Um, at the very end, 
um, after the heist uh, has taken place. Um, it's hard to tell because the lighting's a little different. It's nighttime now, but um, Star and Lily's necklaces are gold now. They've been silver the whole film, and now they now they've got little gold spoons. Because so. they're rich now, right? You get a, a million and a half in your bank Loaded. account. <laughs> <laughs> Loaded, yeah. I was just going to add because technically the spoons change before Lily gets the notification. It's my like head cannon, although I guess I'm one of the writers, so it's probably actual cannon. But um, <laughs> it's my like head cannon that. Um, uh, because Star is a little more liberal with her spending, that and she she had no doubt that it was going to go off. That she probably bought the necklaces ahead of time and gave them like gave it to Lily like before they even got the cash because she wasn't even worried. She knew put it on a credit card, bought it. Like she's like, we're good. Here's a gold spoon. That's, That's why yeah. she said your 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 medical bills paid and then some. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I love that line. I Sarah gives such sass. <laughs> And, and speaking of Easter eggs, uh, I, I know a lot of people don't just pause movies and read the newspapers and the bills, but I did. And I was cracking up. I was like, oh, my God. Like the name of the hospital, the name of the, like there's so many little tiny little funny Easter eggs in there. I love it. So I knew we wanted to do that, but I was waiting for the prompts because you can't really finalize things until then. So uh, shout out to Minuteman Press in Orlando for literally being on standby. We gave them some dummy uh, files to make sure that like the layouts and sizes and color was all proper, but it, it was just a blank. Like there wasn't really anything on it. Or there's just like dummy text. And then um, literally after we got the prompts, I like sat at the computer, like grab, like making the magazine, making the hospital bills, making the security card, making the little ID tag for Daisy's uh, security vest or excuse me, service dog vest. And yeah, on the hospital, each bill has its own hospital name, its own <laughs> billing department. Um, there's like a list of what the what is the billing amount. So like one of them, I think, is like unicorn tears is how much is owed. <laughs> uh, right before Lily starts to swear on the bill, it says the contents of your swear jar is how much money is owed. <laughs> um, we added fees like because you're a woman fee. Uh, it's all in your head fee, like things that people with chronic illnesses and people who have to deal with the medical community a lot get told and have to deal with. Um, it unfortunately has been like scientifically proven that women are not listened to by doctors. They're not treated the same when they go into a doctor's office. Their symptoms are often either ignored or written off sometimes until it's too late. Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, one of their dear friends, unfortunately just passed away from terminal cancer She'd been going to the doctor and going to the doctor and going to the doctor, and they kept writing it off, writing it off, writing it off. And then finally someone listened to her, and by the time they diagnosed her, she had stage four cancer. Oh, wow. And it's so needless. Like, it's so needless. So we put that in there as a joke and because it's funny, but because it's also – it's just – it's so important. Like, not to be whatever, but, like, what does the doctor have to lose for taking five seconds to check? Like what, what, who's it going to hurt if they just take a minute to just look? And if it's no, then it's no, fine. The film, going off a little bit of a tangent here, but the film, it says on the poster based on an almost true story, because um, I was actually in the hospital last uh, November. And when we got all the bills, I was joking around with my husband. I'm like, I'm going to need to go like rob a bank. <laughs> like, I don't know how to pay for any of this. You're going to have to do a heist. <laughs> I'm going to have to do a heist. <laughs> so if there's any art heists in the vicinity of any place where I am, it's totally a coincidence. <laughs> but um, one of the things that happened in the hospital was uh, I asked, I said, is it possible that I have, you know, this? And they said, it's totally possible. I had all the symptoms. I had all the signs. Literally with a totally straight face, the doctor said that test takes too long to run. So we're not going to run it. And I was like, but what if that's what I have? And she was like, well, I don't know what to tell you. What are we supposed to do with you for a week while we wait for the test results? And I was like, keep me alive because you're a doctor and this is a hospital? Like, what do you mean? What are we supposed, what are you supposed to do with me? That was literally her exact words. What are we supposed to do with you while we wait for the results? And as soon wild. as I deadpan what she said, um, and when I got out of the hospital, I was able to go to a specialist who ran a preliminary test in their office, which was positive, and then did the full test, which it does take like a month to get the results, and it was positive. And the whole time I was in the hospital, they were just like, they kept sending the psychiatrist in and going like, do you want to just get a psyche eval? Like, maybe you're fine. And I was like, no, if my labs are abnormal, I would like you to use science and tell me what's wrong with me, please. 
And that's why there's a, it's all in your head fee was one of the, every time the doctor comes in to tell you it's in your head, they charge you for it. That's it's why. all in your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. These, these films, this challenge is all about awareness, but it's not just awareness of, oh, there are people with disabilities. Well, yes, of course, we all know that. It's the awareness of the things that we go through having disabilities. It's not just the disability that we have to put up with. It's the world around us and how the world impacts us, how people treat us, how we even treat each other. I mean, it, there is a lot to be said about an awareness campaign like this. And so it's really important for us to be able to throw those in to all of these films and really show this is the life that we live and this is how we have to to go about things. I mean, we even um, threw that into a line where Lily's care or Lily, uh, Cora's character says, you can't even hear the alarms going off. I mean, and that is something that typically she would never say to her friend, but in that that moment in of emotion, she's thinking about the disability itself. And that's that's something that people would think of all the time. Not, oh, how can you pull off this heist? You're not going to hear the alarms. And so just having that type of awareness, even as Easter eggs, even thrown in, it's so important. And this challenge is really showing that with all these films. Yeah, it's, it's tough that, you know, people without the disabilities, because like you said, th this society and this world is kind of built for people without disabilities. And it's kind of like, we, we don't even think about that kind of thing. Like uh, earlier, you, you kind of apologize because you're going to have to, you know, read the, the subtitles and you might be a little delayed. I was like, there's no need to apologize. But like you said, it's it's kind of like ingrained in you that you, you need to be apologetic for, for something like that when, when you really don't need to. That's because you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a lot of cool... Oh, sorry, Stevie. So no, it's okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, not not everybody is. I mean, I had to. I didn't. I, I had to go to the store on my way home today, and I didn't see when it was my turn in line. And apparently, the the cashier was telling me like it, that it was my turn and trying to say hello and talk to me. And the the lady behind me, who really nicely just kind of waved her hand and pointed, and I turned around like, oh right, I'm so sorry. Like, and she just sighed at me. And that's, that's kind of a daily thing that happens to us. I mean, that kind of stuff, it's, we're, we're an inconvenience and we need to really show we're not an inconvenience. Everybody just needs to learn and be educated on how to make this world accessible for everyone. It's not, no one needs to be an inconvenience of any kind. It just needs, it just needs education. A lot of people don't do it on purpose. It's not, it's, it's incidental is what we call it. It's, it's, it's incidental. It's not meant, but education can stop that advocacy can stop that. And so that's what we want to do. Yeah, and, and usually when, when somebody is like that and then they realize that you are hard of hearing, they're like, Oh, oh okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't even thinking about that. So it's it, like you said, it might be just unintentional, but it is kind of unfortunate. Like why does the default have to be that the person in front of you is a jerk? Like, like when you're the person like dealing with a person with disability, I've had that happen so many times. Um, back in, January, I was trying to get on an elevator because I couldn't physically walk up the stairs that I needed to go up at that time. And I'm standing there, this person comes over and is like practically yelling at me for like being by the elevator and telling me that it's closed, it doesn't work. And I hold up my like, like I'm disabled access pass. <laughs> and I'm like, how am I supposed to get out of here? I can't go up the stairs. <laughs> and they were like immediately so apologetic. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. I meant somebody has to be with you to make it work. And I was like, really you, yeah no that's not what you meant like why is the default that the person in front of you is just trying to take advantage trying to get away with something trying to be a jerk they're rude they're like it's like with the doctors like what is it gonna hurt to ask like if someone just says hi can i help you and the person's like oh i'm waiting for the elevator and they say oh uh did you have an access pass for the elevator and they're like no it's like oh, okay i'm so sorry this elevator actually is only for those who need to use it unfortunately it's not really easy to operate. So we do have to ask everybody to use the stairs. It's Heaven easy. forbid you have a decent, you know, it's so easy. <laughs> like, like you don't have to assume, oh, the person in front of me is a jerk and didn't literally, maybe they didn't hear you. And even, even if literally, <laughs> literally, <laughs> and, <laughs> even, <laughs> and even if they could hear you, like, well, who's to say that the person in front of you didn't just experience some massive personal trauma and they're completely in it in that moment and just weren't paying attention. Like 
you know, should we all always be paying attention and be on our best behavior? Sure. But we're also human. And by granting people human decency, one of my favorite memes is a thing. uh, It's a person in a wheelchair at a school and the stairs are being shoveled with snow. And the wheelchair person is pointing to the ramp and saying, can you shovel the ramp so that I can go in? And the person's like, yeah, hang on. There's all of these people who need to use the stairs. Let me shovel these and then I'll help just you go up the ramp. And the person in the wheelchair is like, but if you shovel the ramp, we all can go in the school. Like everyone can use a ramp. Yeah. Everyone can use a ramp. And I feel like that, that mindset is not as common as it should be. And I think that for me anyway, part of like what drove how I wanted to approach this film is I just want the characters to be real. I just want them to be people, you know, yeah, Lily kind of goes off at star a little bit. And I'm sure, you know, we all have thoughts. We all think things that we're not proud of. And in that moment, Lily's very emotional. She says it out loud. And that's like the only time where like star being deaf has anything to do with, but because it's plot relevant, they're not just like commiserating about whatever. And I really want people who watch this film to see that, A, what we're capable of, like we had no help, like we had no able-bodied help above the line, none, zero. There was nobody without a disability in any key production role, period. Yes, we had like able-bodied PAs and I, I don't know, I didn't ask the background actress, but like <laughs> the, the this is what we can do. And I think if you let people speak for themselves, let people tell you what they can and can't do, work to support and facilitate things. Um, You know, like we had a person on set, uh, there's people who didn't eat meat, people who were vegan, and we had meal options. Like we also, people with severe allergies, so we had allergy options. Like, it's not that hard. You just have to care. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, a little bit of a rant from me. No, no, that's great. I know you and I have talked about accessibility too, and and, uh, especially like the Oscars and just the film film industry as as a whole. Uh, I'm glad that we're we're starting to get a little bit away from that, and and you know, inclusivity is is the name of the game now. I think. I hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> no, it is. It is. People are working. People are working for yes, it. Yeah. Yes. And and technology is helping us too. Obviously, I mean, look at look at what we're doing here. You know, with with the the live captions that that wasn't available just five six years ago. You know, and then now we have that. So. Uh, I'm glad that that we kind of have technology on our side. I know you don't like AI as much as I do, but. <laughs> I think, True statement. I think there's uses I, for it. I like the idea of AI. I like the accessibility and the support that it can do. I have issues with the way it currently operates through the theft of the work of other people. And I have issues with the replacement. Like I saw a meme that said, I don't want AI to write my movies and make my music. I want AI to do my dishes and pay my bills. And there's uses for I, it. Yes. Yeah, there's there's definitely uses for it. I think there's um that's a whole whole other thing but it is unfortunately disability relevant because there are ai tools that assist people who can't otherwise do something without that support and i think that that is very powerful and important and i think it just needs to be ethically done just like anything it just needs to be responsible and ethical and it means that the I'll say corrupt capitalistic mindset of doing things faster, easier, and cheaper with less responsibility needs to shift into being aware of ramifications, caring, having empathy, being responsible, being ethical. Like those elements have to start factoring into the equation. That's my AI soapbox. Yeah, no, like you said, doing it ethically, you know, thinking about not replacing the human, but empowering the human. And not stealing from the humans and then calling it made by the person who typed a prompt in and then ripped off the recycled work from other <laughs> artists. That's, that's a little, that's, yeah, that's, I got a big problem with that. Let, let's talk, let's talk about the fence. What, what is the fence? Am I missing something? <laughs> I'll let Sarah answer yeah, that Sarah, one she what, wants me to. <laughs> what, what's going on? Uh, I mean, you know, the concept of a fence is like a person who gets the goods and then passes off the goods for high dollar amounts. So, you know, um, it was a really fun evolution of this character, I think, because we knew we needed, you know, obviously we needed like a fence, but the characteristics or the like character design of the fence was not as 
integral to the story. So we had a little bit of leeway in terms of how we developed it and um, who the character of Queenie could be. So it was really cool to kind of explore what we wanted it to be. And in the end, it was really about making it someone who you're not going to originally assume is a fence beyond just someone with a service dog not being someone you assume <laughs> being a fence, but just the whole character. And so we really landed on kind of this uh, boss lady who is just there, uh, gets in, gets out, and is willing to do this, um, but isn't like rude about it or isn't like someone who looks kind of like I don't know, edgy or whatever. She just kind of looks very professional and sure of herself and confident. And I really liked playing that character too, because that's someone I try to be, but you know, I also leaned a little bit towards kind of uh, introverted slash. I like my hoodies and my comfort and my fluffy blankets. So getting to embody the person that inside I try to be, but don't always get to project was really fun. Oh, that, that's always the best part of acting is that you get to, you know, play these characters that you you are not necessarily in real life. But it, it, I've heard uh, it, it's so it's so much more fun to play a bad guy than it is to play a good guy <laughs> because you get to, you know, express those inner things that you normally in, in real life. You can't really, you know, you can't rob yeah. a bank, you can't perform a heist, but in a movie you can. Definitely. And that was the cool part about this character is it's not even necessarily, I mean, obviously I wouldn't say this is like the like 100% good guy either. I mean, it's a fence. <laughs> there's some ethical there's things there. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's definitely not like the like hardcore bad guy either. Like I'm, I'm doing this to help out someone who clearly is in need, which is a really fun line to play with. So I, I even like that more than playing like the full on villain. Like for me, that that's the fun straddling of good and bad and um, also brings in questions of like morality and stuff, which you can continue and debate for ages, which is really cool too. I know. That's awesome. And uh, I got a question for Stevie. What, what was the biggest challenge in being involved in this project? All of the stunts. No, I'm kidding. Did you, did you do the handstand and all that stuff? <laughs> Yeah, you're like I did them all. No, no, Hannah was amazing, but um, I, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't feel like it was a huge challenge to do it. It's the the challenge for for me feels like are we representing as much as we can, as best we can, in as little time as we have. I think that was really the challenge. So that was not really necessarily the the filming of it, but kind of all the planning we did in advance, but. Cora's amazing and her team is amazing and being able to, well, work, work with my best friend, but also be able to meet more of her team and getting to, to meet and work with Sarah and being able to create something almost effortlessly, but at the same time, finding those little niches that, that well, let's make sure we include this and we want to represent this because the representation part is so important. That's kind of one of our, our big things in in this industry is that if we get representation, it's a very blanket representation. So it's like, oh, this person's in a wheelchair, so they're a paraplegic. Oh, no, not, not necessarily. necessarily. This person is deaf, so they don't hear anything ever. Well, no, or they don't speak for themselves. Well, no, not necessarily. So there's a lot of differences and a lot of different types of representation we need to bring. So I think just trying to make sure we could get as much of that in there as possible was probably the most difficult part, but the most rewarding part at the same time. So oh, that was such a cool answer. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you want to make sure that you represent, you know, your community correctly and, and authentically as, as you humanly possibly can, you know. Yeah, because it, it I was represent all of the deaf community. Absolutely not, not, not at all. I a completely different ball game. I have a whole different upbringing because I grew up hearing. I mean, I did start to lose my hearing at nineteen, but I don't have the same upbringing of those who were born deaf. That's a hugely different ball game, and so I represent who I am and the types of deafness that I have and that kind of experience that I had not it, not the entire deaf community. So it's, it's important to kind of make those, those different distinctions throughout the film as we tried to do that as much as we could. It, I, 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 I do have to admit, it kind of threw me off a little bit in the, in the film because you, I mean, you start out with the sign language and then all of a sudden you speak and I'm like, wait a minute, that, uh, 
it, it threw me off a little bit because I, I have to admit I did have that bias. But then as, as the movie kind of progresses, you, you do the double, you know, you do, you do the sign language, but you also do the, the, the speaking and everything. So yeah, that, that kind of cleared it up for me a little bit. Yeah, we get this kind of, and, and I know all of us kind of get this. We, and Cora was touching on it a little bit earlier. It's like, oh, when she was talking about being on the elevator, well, you don't look disabled. That's my, that's, that's the best lines. Oh, you don't look deaf. <laughs> you don't look disabled. I didn't realize we had an image. Yeah, like, like what does that look yeah, like? Am I supposed to look like a little white outline on a blue pad? <laughs> Is that what we're supposed to look like? I don't think we look like that. We look like humans. So we're all very different. And those biases are, are okay to have. I mean, that's just like Cora said earlier, that's just being human. You only know what you know and what you've seen. What I've been exposed and to. That yeah. tells us more, hey, we need more representation. If we have so many people with those biases, it's because they're not seeing us. And so they need to be given ways to see us. And now that we're in this hugely interconnected world, I mean, I know Cora and I grew, grew up pre-internet. So like having this now internet world where everyone is connected, we should have a lot more representation than we do. And that's why like this is so such an important challenge. It's an important project for us to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys did it. And Cora, what, what was your biggest challenge uh, kind of right? Because I know you're the writer, you're the producer, you're the director, you're the lead actress. Like, I, I could just keep going, right? You're like, <laughs> when those credits rolled, I saw Cora's name like 18 times on there. So uh, Cora, what, what was your biggest challenge kind of tackling this project? So I will say I'm a co-writer. Um, I came up with the idea of the story, but Stevie and I very much wrote the script together. Um, just credit where credit is due for that. That was probably the biggest challenge. I I am disabled. I do have physical um, and mental limitations that on the one hand, you know, I have over 20 years of industry experience. I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been dealing with my specific disabilities since 2012. So I've had a lot of time to kind of figure out where my boundaries are, how far I can go, what safeties I can put in place. Like people don't see when they look at me, but my world is like, I joke around sometimes that it's either like a video game or like a massive chessboard where like I'm intrinsically aware of every single little detail around me. I'm aware of things like if I see someone 20 feet away and they're holding a sandwich, I will and like I see it on my peripheral vision and I will immediately hold my breath because I don't know if it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I'm allergic to peanuts. Oh, wow. I, if I see an orange candy bag open, I will immediately hold my breath because I don't know if that's Reese's. Like I have these like sort of constant surveillance of the environment around me and I have to know like how to schedule. Like our call time day one, I think was at 1130 in the morning. Our call time day two was 1230. The first day we were on set total, like from walking in to walking off for about seven hours. Um, and usually you're on set for 15, you know, 20. Uh, I pushed the call for day two because I knew that I wasn't um, doing so great. I had built in safeties around me. For example, there's a little uh, sort of beige notebook that Lily has in a bunch of the scenes. Uh, that is Cora's notebook and that is Cora's shot list and storyboard. Oh, nice. And I just had it. So literally between takes, I could just open it and like look and check to make sure we were getting the shots. We didn't have a first AD beyond me. So I had to keep track of all of that as well. Um, Lily's phone is also my uh, personal cell phone. Um, the guy who did the VFX uh, was in Canada and he was leaving for a feature film premiere on uh, Friday morning. So we only had Thursday to get the VFX shot done. So we had to, I had to plan, not just like as a producer, plan the schedule and then as the stunt choreographer, choreograph the sequence down the hallway in a way that can integrate with lasers in a way that causes the least amount of work needed for post-production. Like it's easier to have somebody move their hand and the laser goes like this than it is to have the hand down and the laser go like this. Cause you have to, you have to make two different layers. It's not a three-dimensional image. So you have to make it look three-dimensional. So I had to chore like not only shot list from a cinematography side, but then from a choreography side and a VFX side, choreograph action down the hallway that would integrate with lasers in a way that would be the least amount of work for the VFX supervisor in the end to put it together. We then shot that first so that we could give the footage to Sarah, who's also an editor, who was dumping the footage while Stevie and I were filming our scenes. And then that night I had to cut it together into a very rough 
sequence because he can't, I can't get more of a shot if he does VFX on only part of it, but I can cut it down if I want to edit it in. So I gave him a very rough string out of all the VFX sequences. And then he was prepping shots. So between takes on day two, he would be sending me clips and I would be looking at them on my phone between takes. So I had all of my dialogue while also sim coming. So it was also an ASL while directing and producing and keeping track of the schedule and being one of the cinematographers with my husband and handling the lighting setups and making sure everything looked good in the monitor and then being the production designer. So making sure that the set was set up properly and the um, wardrobe, you know, we're all styled, like we all have our own kind of look as characters. Um, I actually love that I'm kind of dressed more like Star and Stevie's dressed more like Lily today. <laughs> um, we, um, I, Someone asked like if they were based on real people and I was like, Lily and Star are like, like me and Stevie are both Lily and Star in different situations. And we just sort of extracted the characteristics into one person, took all of the anxiety and the stress and the weight and put it in one and took all of the shenanigans and the <laughs> wild and crazy and put it in the other. Uh, don't rob art museums though. Let's just put that <laughs> yeah, let's make that clear. <laughs> we are innocent people. Um, but like I said, I have the 20 years of experience. I've worked in every department on a film set. I am neurodivergent and having 50 billion things for my brain to focus on is actually better for me than having to do a single task. And I've worked out all of these systems on how to do it. So the only sort of biggest challenge for me is that if I push myself to the top of what I'm capable of, I become like that camel with like the pile of stuff and then a little butterfly lands and all of a sudden the camel falls, falls down. Yeah. So um, that is something that is very challenging for me and something I'm working on learning how to do better so that I can stack myself and do everything I want to do because I grew up able-bodied. I grew up, I was a set rigger climbing, you know, 50 foot truss rigs that I built. Like it, that was my life and my passion and I can't do that anymore. So sometimes my mind doesn't remember what my body can't do. And I have to sort of work to find that balance to be able to pull something off like this. And honestly, the only way I was able to do it was because I had an incredible group of people with me. Like even just having the scenes with Stevie and Sarah and, you know, we'd rehearsed and I'd gone over like as a director, like what I wanted from them character wise, but like they brought it like Stevie, her performance is so organic and so strong. And Sarah brought so much sass. I like, there was a couple of times where I like laughed oh, I on the set it. just because <laughs> it, it made it really easy for me as a director. Like we'd gone over the wardrobe, everybody had their outfits and that was it. I didn't have to go running around after them and being like, Oh my God, where are your earrings or whatever. They showed up, they had their wardrobe on, their hair was done, their their makeup was done. Um, I made sure Sarah got first billing for makeup because hers was just so good. It was great. Um, it was really good, yeah. So having that team where I might be planning everything, but then there's people doing it. And we did have some great PAs um, when we were filming at the art gallery and in the cafe. So like, I didn't have to physically set up that space, the PAs. I just gave them directions. They set it up. I showed up. I tweaked a little bit of stuff. And then we moved on to the next location while they cleaned up. Like I didn't have to stand there physically doing everything. My husband's spaceship uh, was the other DP with me. And um, there's like so many, so many places I wish we could have done more with cinematography. Like we could have had more dynamic camera motion. We could have had a lot of other things, but like for the VFX in the hallway, having a static camera is just faster to work with. It's easier. It's less work. It's they can easier. do it, but so much easier. So we opted for static camera shots. And I then had the challenge as the director of making it as visually interesting. Like you're not going to notice that the camera's not moving when there's literally someone balancing on one hand with like a laser, Laser's like scanning around. under yeah, the There's a lot going yeah. on in that shot. Yeah. Yeah. So we tried to make it um, while still having the buddy comedy elements, while still having that dynamic between Lily and Star, while still having, you know, Lily like up against the wall, like watching the lasers like crop in front of her. So um, I think I answered your question. Sorry. Yeah, no, for sure. You did mention that Sarah's an editor. Did she get to edit uh, this film? Yeah, we uh, sat side by side because um, <laughs> I I said that single task, I do not do well with single tasks. And Sarah literally pulled up a chair and was like, okay, 
So we just sat there in every single cut and like, um, I can let her speak to that. I've talked a lot. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, there for the entirety of the edit. Um, I don't think there was any point where I was even in like another room, maybe running to the bathroom is the extent of me not being in the same room. Um, but uh, it was very much a collaborative process, but it was also for me the first time I've done a like less than 72 hours to edit something. Um, I know Cora's done the 48 hour thing before. I have not. I don't know how so, she does that. Honestly, like I've never tried it, but it sounds so stressful to me. <laughs> it, it was a <laughs> unique challenge uh, for sure. There was a lot of like, you know, you, you think about, from a non-filmmaker standpoint, you're like, oh, you just edit it. But then there's like the color and the, we had the VFX and we added captions and, you know, it's on and on and on of all the different layers of the post-production process. And fitting that down into that tight time frame was a fun challenge, uh, definitely a challenge, but a fun challenge. Um, and I really loved working with Cora, especially just because we could bounce those ideas off and like, if things are getting really intense in the film, like, okay, what if we had this person slide in this way? And then like, oh, we could do this or split the screen this way or things like that. And this film really uh, had the creative space because of uh, what type of film we're creating, the heist. Um, you know, certain films that wouldn't work, but this film, you could play with those things. And so playing around, uh, you know, within the time frame, but still having the ability to, uh, make those decisions and see what worked um, was really cool. And also uh, just, you know, as an editor, it's the best part of the film process because that's when the story comes to life. I mean, you can make all the different shots, um, but until you pull them together and see if they work, it's a kind of a fingers crossed and hope for the best. Um, but, you know, the edit makes it real and makes it actually say, yes, we did it. Good job, team, which is fun. Yeah, I always say the editing is where the story actually comes together because when, when you're on set, you can shoot however you want, but I can make you feel something that even the director hadn't even thought of. So the way that I cut, because I'm an editor too, so <laughs> the way the way that I put it together, the way that my cuts are made, that kind of thing, did it, did it help you being on set and even being in the movie when you went back to the editing bay that the, you kind of already had kind of the edits already in your head? I would say... Uh it's 50 50 um especially given being in front of the camera more than being behind the camera i've done it where i've been on set behind the camera and then done the edit afterwards and so that i felt like i had more of an idea of what the footage looked like just because i could see it and i could see the reactions or i could see how it looked or just get the idea but being in front of the camera was definitely a new experience in terms of then flipping around and having to edit myself being in front of the camera um, because I didn't necessarily have as much of an idea of what it looked like. Obviously, I think there's pros and cons to being on set as an editor. Pros being you know what happened and therefore when you're looking at the footage, you can be like, I remember this. Um, whereas you're, you're getting it for the first time in post-production and you weren't on set, then you're looking at it and sometimes you're going, what in the what am I looking at? Especially if it's one of those wonky shots that isn't actually being used, but you have to figure that out uh, if you don't have um, scripty notes or anything like that. So that's fun. But um, being able to edit myself was, this wasn't good or bad. It just was. I just wanted to add to that, that, um, some of the editing choices that we made were because we only had five minutes to tell the whole story and we had a lot to fit in. And some of it was very specifically like the, the laser sequence in the hallway that was storyboarded like frame by frame. I don't usually shoot like that, but I had to for that. So like each frame, each step was shot in a way to be cut very specifically. So it was really like almost drag and drop for that specific section. Then there were things like in a hearing person film, you can have a voiceover. It's kind of weird to have a deaf person voiceover. So um, my husband and I had just rewatched all of the Oceans movies for like inspiration as nice. we were. And there's a lot of Oceans 11 nods throughout the film. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things was the split screen. And we had the idea of what if star stays on screen when she's telling Lily about it, then we can see her. And then when the guard comes in, so that whole split screen sequence was done 
uh, very intentionally so that we could have Lily on screen signing. And then because we needed it to be so specific, those were like manually created keyframed effects. Like it wasn't like a swipe or like literally we were in there like marking the keyframe on the shot and manually putting it where we wanted it on the screen. Um, there's like maybe three wipes. I think when the title comes on and off, we just used a wipe effect, but all of the other edits, every other placement of every shot was manually putting the shot where we wanted it and manually adjusting. Um, so it was, it was a lot of work. So how, how do you balance then? Uh, because I, I, I did notice that when, when there's a lot of signing and stuff, it's very silent and it, it kind of feels a little bit off from, from, you know, a regular movie that literally has, you know, sound the entire way how, how did you kind of manage when when to do that and when to you know add background noise or whatever for the scene in the car because we're outside the car already i like when sound shuts off probably for festivals we'll add like a, a like a background like just a white like sh noise just white or something noise, yeah yeah but i might not because for me, it was kind of like a moment of just acknowledging deafness. Like if you can't hear, if you're 100% deaf, you, ca you can't hear anything. It's just silent. And I felt like going from that chaos and the music and the da 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 da, -da and all this stuff is happening. And then it's just dead quiet. And they're kind of arguing, but as Stevie can speak to this more, I wanted to give space to that moment where let's go inside star's head for a second let's let's give that character and then as soon as the door opens you hear the alarm the sound picks back up again creatively i wanted to make that space for the character then the rest of them there is there is room tone you know it is it's just um what you hear um around uh when she's on the floor signing to me uh you can hear her like clothes moving and i really really appreciated that our dialogue editor huge shout out to ryan coda um when he mixed the dialogue he mixed the clothes while she was signing like that was the sound that he gave her during that time and i thought that was really beautiful because that's what a hearing person would hear when asl is being used um but i can let stevie speak to kind of her thoughts on it too and i don't think i realized that he was purposely doing that <laughs> i did not realize that i was like oh hey that's really cool you learn stuff all the time um but yeah it is it's funny and i wish i could give her a shout out but i, I cannot think of her handle at the moment but there is a deaf creator on on instagram who wears beaded bracelets and the hearing community is just at her all the time because she doesn't turn the sound off on her videos but otherwise there is no sound it's just the movement of her her hands her clothing her jewelry background noises her dog right all the stuff as she signs and the hearing community is so bothered by it. And she goes, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not here to keep you from being bothered. If you're being bothered by it, think about why you're being bothered. Think about how does that throw you off? Why does that throw you off? If you're just not used to it, okay. And then it maybe throws you off, like you had mentioned earlier, it threw me off, but it didn't damper your whole day. It didn't, it's not something that now you, your whole life is thrown out, out of the window. <laughs> like it just threw you off because you went, huh, I didn't think about it that way. That's what we want. That's the kind of representation we want. It, we don't want it to be where, oh, well, it's this, it's now a thing to where oh, we're trying to shove something down your throat. Well, no, that's why the whole movie is not like that because it's not about that. It's not, it's about a heist. It's not about star being deaf. That's not the point, but it is part of her character. It is part of her life. So if we put that little small tidbit in there, that representation just gets a little nod real quick and make someone like you who's watching and go oh but it's just for a quick second and it's just enough to go okay it makes you that. think yeah it makes it you stop you think, which is the whole point i mean the whole point is the representation and and advocacy so if like hey we can show just a little bit of what we of what we experience that's important i mean i get i get the opportunity to do that all the time i had a conversation with someone yesterday who didn't understand why the barbie movie had an ASL interpretation that that was made for it for HBO by a deaf actress. She did the whole movie in, in ASL and it wow. was put in the, HBO uh, promoted it, put it out. And he couldn't understand what, why, why would she do the songs? Why is she signing the songs? That doesn't make any sense. Like don't deaf people know how to read? Like they can just read the captions. And I said, well, well, yes, of course, <laughs> of course, deaf people can read. But if you think about it, that's not a, the words don't portray the tone. They don't portray 
the feeling or anything of, of the song itself. I'm like, I want you to try something, mute it. Watch the whole performance of, of the song. He was talking specifically about I'm just Ken. Watch the whole performance on mute and see, does it have the same effect on you as it does when you're listening to it? If the answer is no, it doesn't have the same effect. That's the difference between us reading the text and us getting to see it in its full glory and the language that we use. That's a whole different ball game. And I, I was lucky enough to talk to someone who went, oh, wow, I really didn't think about it that way. I'm like, okay, the next time you see a music video that you've never seen before, don't listen to the song. Don't just, just read it. the lyrics. Just yeah. It watch it. And then watch it again and unmute it and feel that difference. And then you'll really, it'll hit home for you. And he went, well, then why don't we do that all the time? I'm like, exactly. That's what we want you to learn. <laughs> that's exactly what we want. And it's, it's like that for every single type of person. It's not just those of us who are deaf and hard of hearing. I mean, it's, all of those of, of us with disabilities, we just want you to see what we go through so that you can help us fix it, help us make the world a better place. That, that, that's all we want. We don't want you to be angry. We don't want to hate on you. That's it's not about that at all. And some really get offended by those kinds of things when like when that creator, content creator refuses to turn her sound off. No. Well, if it really bothers you, you can mute it. Go for it. But otherwise, no, I don't, that's not my intent. And and her intent is not to anger anyone. It's just to say, hey, this is the world that we're in. Let's let's do something about it. Let's make it better. Oh, I love I love that answer because it it that's exactly what I was looking for. It kind of puts you into the headspace of someone with that kind of disability. And I, I kind of compare it to uh, the movie A Quiet Place, where the little girl it like the sound design in that movie was fantastic because it's like whenever it goes completely silent. It, it does kind of make you, as a hearing person, it, it makes you feel a little uncomfortable. And and then you realize, like, holy crap, this this little girl literally lives this way. Like, this is her reality. This is what she actually experiences every single day. And I, I love that. I love that. That's a really good answer. I, and I don't necessarily live in the same way that she does. I mean, that's um, that's Millie. She's a really awesome person. But she um, she does live with with more deafness than I do. She was born deaf. I was not. Her experience is completely different. So even though we give that kind of silent moment, even though that's not necessarily how I experience my life, it is part of the community I'm in. And so we want to represent as much of, of the different communities as we can in the film. Oh, that is so cool. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming on. I want to be respectful of your time. I know we've gone over an hour already, so I, I, I don't want to keep this going on uh, too much longer, but uh, I do want to wrap up. Cora, where, where can people find the film? Where can they watch it uh, if, if they were interested? This week is very important. There is the awareness campaign about the film. So if you are watching this between April 13th and April 21st, go to the Disability Film Challenge, the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge YouTube um, you can also go to their Facebook, uh, look for The Heist, uh, be sure to watch it, uh, comment, like it, share it with all your friends. Um, we do get like points for the views. There are over 130 films that were made this year from around the world, including some very, very incredible filmmakers. Um, so we are just honored to be a part of it. Obviously go through, give as much support to all of the films as you want, but especially The Heist. The Heist, and, The Heist, The Heist. Um, Ice, the ice, the ice. Um, and you can, um, we'll be linking it on our social media, the Space Dream Productions on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I might even post something on TikTok. <clears throat> yeah, the most important is to watch it on the uh, Disability Film Challenge YouTube because that is where, where they're watching kind of what reach we're able to generate. And that's also where all of the films are. As far as I know, the film will live there for at least a year. So if you're catching this later, um, you can still go there and check it out. Uh, we also will most likely put it, I have to check how it affects festivals if we have a non-festival version on our website, but we might put it on our website. Well, we will definitely eventually put it on our website, um, but it will probably be on our Patreon, uh, the Space Dream Productions Patreon uh, between then. So any of those places, but April 13th through 21st, Eastern Seals Disability Film Challenge YouTube. That's where to check it out. I'll teach you a really cool sign that you can know. It's YouTube. It's YouTube. The YouTube. reason being is the play button. Okay. Oh, wow. That's so cool. YouTube. So now you've got something new to learn. So share it on YouTube. Watch it on YouTube. 
Share it on YouTube, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys again. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad that all three of you were able to make it today and, and I was able to chat with all of you guys. Uh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. I, I love what you guys did with the film and um, I hope you guys win. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for supporting us. Absolutely. Any day, any day, Cora. You're, you're welcome back on the podcast anytime. You're amazing. The record. So where, where can everybody find you and, and your companies, uh, Cora, uh, on Instagram and on, on social media? Uh, so we are Space Dream Productions, and that is our website, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. Um, I do have a Cora Linda director page on Facebook that sometimes gets posted to by my husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. And uh, Stevie, uh, where can everybody find your stuff? Um, you can mostly find me on Instagram at the real Stevie Star or sorry at the real Stevie Collins. Um, I have a uh, TikTok for Stevie Stars three as well. So check it out. Awesome. And Sarah. Mainly I am on Instagram at Sarah S A R A H underscore M underscore pen P E N N. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Uh, you can find us at Blue Box Podcast all in all the platforms, including TikTok. So <laughs> thanks again, ladies. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>